Section 1. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Section 1. Chapter 1. As long ago as 1860, it was the proper thing to be born at home. At present, so I am told, the high gods of medicine have decreed that the first cries of the young shall be uttered upon the anesthetic air of a hospital, preferably a fashionable one. So young Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were fifty years ahead of style when they decided one day in the summer of 1860 that their first baby should be born in a hospital. Whether this anarchism had any bearing upon the astonishing history I am about to set down will never be known. I shall tell you what occurred and let you judge for yourself. The Roger Buttons held an enviable position, both social and financial, in the antebellum Baltimore. They were related to the this family and that family, which, as every southerner knew, entitled them to membership in that enormous peerage which largely populated the confederacy this was the first experience with the charming old custom of having babies mr button was naturally nervous he hoped it would be a boy so that he could be sent to yale college in connecticut at which institution mr button himself had been known for four years by the somewhat obvious nickname of cuff on the September morning consecrated to the enormous event, he arose nervously at six o'clock, dressed himself, adjusted an impeccable stock, and hurried forth through the streets of Baltimore to the hospital to determine whether the darkness of the night had borne in any new life upon its bosom. When he was approximately a hundred yards from the Maryland Private Hospital for Ladies and Gentlemen, he saw Dr. Keene, the family physician, descending the front steps rubbing his hands together with a washing movement, as all doctors are required to do by the unwritten ethics of their profession. Mr. Roger Button, the president of Roger Button & Company Wholesale Hardware, began to run toward Dr. Keene with much less dignity than was expected from a southern gentleman of that picturesque period. "'Dr. Keene!' he called. "'Dr. Keene!' The doctor heard him, faced around, and stood waiting, a curious expression settling on his harsh, medicinal face as mr button drew near what happened demanded mr button as he came up in a gasping rush what was it how is she a boy who is what talk sense said dr king sharply he appeared somewhat irritated is the child born begged mr button dr king frowned why yes i suppose after fashion again he threw a curious glance at mr button is my wife all right? Yes. Is it a boy or girl? Here now, cried Dr. Keene in a perfect passion of irritation. I'll ask you to go and see for yourself. Outrageous! He snapped the last word out in almost one syllable. Then he turned away, muttering, Do you imagine a case like this will help my professional reputation? What more would ruin me, ruin anybody? What's the matter? demanded Mr. Button, appalled. Triplets? No, not triplets, answered the doctor cuttingly. What's more, you can go and see for yourself, and get another doctor. I brought you into the world, young man, and I've been physician to your family for forty years, but I'm through with you. I don't want to see you or any of your relatives ever again. Goodbye. Then he turned sharply, and without another word climbed into his phaeton, which was waiting at the curbstone, and drove severely away. Mr. Button stood there upon the sidewalk, stupefied and trembling from head to foot. What horrible mishap had occurred? He had suddenly lost all desire to go into the Maryland Private Hospital for ladies and gentlemen. It was with the greatest difficulty that a moment later he forced himself to mount the steps and enter the front door. A nurse was sitting behind the desk in the opaque gloom of the hall. Swallowing his shame, Mr. Button approached her. "'Good morning,' she remarked, looking up at him pleasantly. "'Good morning. Uh, I'm Mr. Button.' At this, a look of utter terror spread itself over the girl's face. She rose to her feet and seemed about to fly from the hall, restraining herself only with the most apparent difficulty. 
"'I want to see my child,' said Mr. Button. The nurse gave a little scream. "'Oh, of course,' she cried hysterically. "'Upstairs, right upstairs. Go up.' She pointed the direction, and Mr. Button, bathed in cool perspiration, turned falteringly and began to mount to the second floor. In the upper hall he addressed another nurse, who approached him, basin in hand. "'I'm Mr. Button,' he managed to articulate. "'I want to see my—' Clank. The basin clattered to the floor and rolled in the direction of the stairs. Clank, clank. It began a methodical descent, as if sharing in the general terror which this gentleman provoked. "'I want to see my child,' Mr. Button almost shrieked. He was on the verge of collapse. Clank. The basin reached the first floor. The nurse regained control of herself and threw Mr. Button a look of hearty contempt. "'All right, Mr. Button,' she agreed in a hushed voice. "'Very well. But if you knew what a state it's put us all in this morning, it's perfectly outrageous. The hospital will never have a ghost of a reputation after—' "'Hurry!' he cried hoarsely. "'I can't stand this.' "'Come this way, then, Mr. Button.' He dragged himself after her. At the end of a long hallway they reached a room from which proceeded a variety of howls. Indeed, a room which in later parlance would have been known as the crying room. They entered. "'Well,' gasped Mr. Button, "'which is mine?' "'There,' said the nurse. Mr. Button's eyes followed her pointing finger, and this is what he saw. Wrapped in a voluminous white blanket, and partially crammed into one of the cribs, there sat an old man, apparently about seventy years of age. His sparse hair, almost white, and from his chin, dripped a long, smoke-colored beard, which waved absurdly back and forth, fanned by the breeze, coming in at the window. He looked up at Mr. Button with dim, faded eyes, in which lurked a puzzled question. "'Am I mad?' thundered Mr. Button, his terror resolving into rage. "'Is this some ghastly hospital joke?' "'Doesn't seem like a joke to us,' replied the nurse severely. "'And I don't know whether you're mad or not, but that is most certainly your child.' The cool perspiration redoubled on Mr. Button's forehead, closed his eyes, and then, opening them, looked again. There was no mistake. He was gazing at a man of threescore and ten, a baby of threescore and ten, a baby whose feet hung over the sides of the crib in which it was reposing. The old man looked placidly from one to the other for a moment, and then suddenly spoke in a cracked and ancient voice. "'Are you my father?' he demanded. Mr. Button and the nurse stared violently. "'Because, if you are,' went on the old man querously, "'I wish you'd get me out of this place, or at least get them to put a comfortable rocker in here.' "'Where in God's name did you come from? Who are you?' burst out Mr. Button frantically. "'Can't tell you exactly who I am,' replied the querulous whine, "'because I've only been born a few hours, but my last name is certainly Button.' "'You lie. You're an impostor. The old man turned wearily to the nurse. "'Nice way to welcome a newborn child,' he complained in a weak voice. "'Tell him he's wrong. Why don't you?' "'You're wrong, Mr. Button,' said the nurse severely. "'This is your child, and you have to make the best of it. "'We're going to ask you to take him home with you as soon as possible, sometime today.' "'Home?' repeated Mr. Button incredulously. "'Yes, we can't have him here. We really can't, you know.' "'I'm right glad of it,' whined the old man. "'This is a fine place to keep a youngster of quiet taste. "'With all this yelling and howling,' I would be able to get away to sleep. I ask for something to eat. Here his voice rose to a shill rise of protest. And they brought me a bottle of milk. Mr. Button sat down upon the chair near his son and concealed his face in his hands. My heavens, he murmured in an ecstasy of horror. What will people say? What must I do? "'You'll have to take him home,' insisted the nurse, immediately. A grotesque picture formed itself with dreadful clarity before the eyes of the tortured man, a picture of himself walking through the crowded streets of the city with this appalling apparition stalking by his side. "'Can't, can't,' he moaned. 
people would stop to speak to him and what was he going to say he would have to introduce this this septuagenarian this is my son born early this morning and then the old man would gather his blanket around him and they would plod on past the bustling stores the slave market for a dark instant mr button wished passionately that his son was black past the luxurious houses of the residential district past the home for the aged come pull yourself together commanded the nurse say here the old man announced suddenly if you think i'm going to walk home in this blanket you're entirely mistaken babies always have blankets with a malicious cackle the old man held up a small white swaddling garment <laughs> look this is what they had ready for me babies always wear these said the nurse primly well said the old man this baby's not going to wear anything in about two minutes this blanket itches they might at least have given me a sheet keep it on keep it on said mr button hurriedly he turned to the nurse what'll i do go downtown and buy your son some clothes mr button's son's voice followed him down the hall and a cane father i want to have a cane mr button banged the outer door savagely chapter two good 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 morning mr button said nervously to the clerk in the chesapeake dry goods company i want to buy some clothes for my child how old is your child sir about six hours answered mr button with due consideration baby supply department in the rear i don't think i'm not sure that's what i want it's uh, he's an unusually large-sized child exceptionally uh, large they have the largest children's sizes where's the boys department inquired mr button shifting his ground desperately he felt that the clerk must surely scent his shameful secret right here well he hesitated the notion of dressing his son in men's clothes was repugnant to him if say he could only find a very large boy suit he might cut off the long and awful beard dye the white hair brown and thus manage to conceal the worst and to retain something of his own self-respect not to mention his position in baltimore society but a frantic inspection of the boys department revealed no suits to fit the newborn button he blamed the store of course in such cases it is the thing to blame the store how old did you say that boy of yours was demanded the clerk curiously he's sixteen oh i beg your pardon i thought you said six hours you'll find the youth department in the next aisle mr button turned miserably away then he stopped brightened and pointed his finger toward a dress dummy in the window display there he exclaimed i'll take that suit out on the dummy the clerk stared why he protested that's not a child's suit at least it is but it's for fancy dress you could wear it yourself wrap it up insisted his customer nervously that's what i want the astonished clerk obeyed back at the hospital mr button entered the nursery and almost threw the package at his son here's your clothes he snapped out the old man untied the package and viewed its contents with a quizzical eye it looks sort of funny to me he complained i don't want to be made a monkey of you made a monkey of me retorted mr button fiercely never you mind how funny you look put them on or i'll i'll, I'll spank you he swallowed uneasily at the penultimate word feeling nervously that it was the proper thing to say all right father this was a grotesque simulation of final respect you've lived longer you know best just as you say as before the sound of word father caused mr button to start violently in hurry i'm hurrying father when his son was dressed mr button regarded him with depression the costume consisted of dotted socks pink pants and a belted blouse with a wide white collar over the latter waved the long whitish beard drooping almost to the waist the effect was not good wait 
Mr. Button seized a hospital shears, and with three quick snips, amputated a large section of the beard. But even with this improvement, the ensemble fell far short of perfection. The remaining brush of scraggly hair, the watery eyes, the ancient teeth, seemed oddly out of tone with the gaiety of the costume. Mr. Button, however, was obdurate. He held out his hand. "'Come along,' he said sternly. His son took the hand trustingly. "'Where are you going to call me, Dad?' He quavered as they walked from the nursery. "'Just baby for a while. Do you think of a better name?' Mr. Button grunted. "'I don't know,' he answered harshly. "'I think we'll call you Methuselah.'" Chapter 3 Even after the new addition to the Button family had had his hair cut short, and then dyed to a sparse, unnatural black, had had his face shaved so close that it glistened, and had been attired in small boy clothes, made to order by a flabbergasted tailor, it was impossible for Button to ignore the fact that his son was an excuse for a first family baby. Despite his aged stoop, Benjamin Button, for that was his name they called him instead of by the appropriate but individuous Methuselah, was five feet eight inches tall. His clothes did not conceal this, nor did the clipping and dyeing of his eyebrows disguise the fact that the eyes under were faded and watery and tired. In fact, the baby nurse who had been engaged in advance left the house after one look, in a state of considerable indignation. But Mr. Button persisted in his unwavering purpose. Benjamin was a baby, and a baby he should remain. At first he declared that if Benjamin didn't like warm milk, he could go without food altogether, but he was finally prevailed upon to allow his son bread and water, and even oatmeal by way of compromise. One day he brought home a rattle, and giving it to Benjamin insisted in no uncertain terms that he should play with it, whereupon the old man took it with a weary expression, and could be heard jingling it obediently at intervals throughout the day. There can be no doubt, though, that the rattle bored him, and that he found other, more soothing amusements when he was left alone. For instance, Mr. Button discovered one day that during the preceding week he had smoked more cigars than ever before, a phenomenon which was explained a few days later when entering the nursery unexpectedly he found the room full of a faint blue haze and Benjamin, with a guilty expression on his face, trying to conceal the butt of a dark Havana. This, of course, called for a severe spanking, but Mr. Button found that he could not bring himself to administer it. He merely warned his son that he would stun his growth. Nevertheless, he persisted in his attitude. He brought home lead soldiers, he brought home toy trains, he brought large pleasant animals made of cotton. And to perfect the illusion which he was creating, for himself at least, he passionately demanded of the clerk in the toy store whether the paint would come off the pink duck if the baby put it in his mouth. But despite all his father's efforts, Benjamin refused to be arrested. He would steal down the back stairs and return to the nursery with a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica, over which he would pour through an afternoon, while his cotton cows and his Noah's Ark were left neglected on the floor. Against such a stubbornness, Mr. Button's efforts were of little avail. The sensation created in Baltimore was at first prodigious. What the mishap would have cost the Buttons and their kinfolk socially cannot be determined, for the outbreak of the Civil War brought the city's attention to other things. A few people who were unfailingly polite racked their brains for compliments to give to the parents, and finally hit upon the ingenious device of declaring that the baby resembled his grandfather a fact which, due to the standard state of decay common to all men of seventy, could not be denied. Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were not pleased, but Benjamin's grandfather was furiously insulted. Benjamin, once he left the hospital, took life as he found it. Several small boys were brought to see him, and he spent a stiff-jointed afternoon trying to work up an interest in tops and marbles. He even managed quite accidentally to break a kitchen window with the stone from a slingshot, a feat which secretly delighted his father. Thereafter, Benjamin contrived to break something every day. 
but he did these things only because they were expected of him and because he was by nature obliging when his grandfather's initial antagonism wore off benjamin and that gentleman took enormous pleasure in one another's company they would sit for hours these two so far apart in age and experience and like old cronies discuss with tireless monotony the slow events of the day benjamin felt more at ease in his grandfather's presence than in his parents they seemed always somewhat in awe of him and despite the dictatorial authority they exercised over him frequently addressed him as mister he was as puzzled as any one else at the apparently advanced age of his mind and body at birth he read up on the medical journal but found that no such case had been previously recorded at his father's urging he made honest attempts to play with other boys and frequently he joined in milder games football shook him up too much he feared that in case of a fracture his ancient bones would refuse to knit when he was five he was sent to kindergarten where he initiated into the art of pasting green paper on orange paper of weaving colored maps and manufacturing eternal cardboard necklaces he was inclined to drowse off to sleep in the middle of these tasks a habit which both irritated and frightened his young teacher to his relief she complained to his parents and he was removed from the school the roger buttons told their friends that they felt he was too young by the time he was twelve years old his parents had grown used to him indeed so strong is the force of custom that they no longer felt that he was different from any other child except when some curious anomaly reminded them of the fact one day a few weeks after his twelfth birthday while looking in the mirror benjamin made or thought he made an astonishing discovery did his eyes deceive him or had his hair turned in the dozen years of his life from white to iron gray under its concealing dye was the network of wrinkles on his face becoming less pronounced was his skin healthier and firmer with even a touch of ruddy winter crawler he could not tell he knew that he no longer stooped and that his physical condition had improved since the early days of his life can it be he thought to himself or rather scarcely dared to think he went to his father i'm grown he announced determinedly i want to put on long trousers his father hesitated well he said finally i don't know fourteen is the age for putting on long trousers and you are only twelve but you have to admit protested benjamin i'm big for my age the father looked at him with illusory speculation i'm not so sure of that he said i was as big as you when i was twelve this was not true it was all part of roger button's silent agreement with himself to believe in his son's normality finally a compromise was reached benjamin was to continue to dye his hair he was to make a better attempt to play with boys of his own age he was not to wear spectacles or carry a cane in the street in return for these concessions he was allowed his first suit of long trousers chapter four of the life of benjamin button between his twelfth and twenty-first year i intend to say little suffice to record that they were years of normal ungrowth when benjamin was eighteen he was erect as a man of fifty he had more hair and it was of a dark gray his step was firm his voice had lost its crack quaver and descended to a healthy baritone so his father sent him up to connecticut to take examinations for entrance to yale college benjamin passed his examinations and became a member of the freshman class on the third day following his matriculation he received a notification from Mr. Hart, the college registrar, to call at his office and arrange his schedule. Benjamin, glancing in the mirror, decided that his hair needed a new application of its brown dye, but an anxious inspection of his bureau drawer disclosed that the dye bottle was not there. Then he remembered. He had emptied it the day before and thrown it away. He was in a dilemma. He was due at the registrar's in five minutes. There seemed to be no help for it. He must go as he was. He did good morning said the registrar politely you've come to inquire about your son why as a matter of fact my name's button 
began Benjamin, but Mr. Hart cut him off. "'Very glad to meet you, Mr. Button. I'm expecting your son here any minute.' "'That's me,' burst out Benjamin. "'I'm a freshman.' "'What? I'm a freshman.' "'Surely you're joking.' "'Not at all.' The registrar frowned and glanced at a card before him. "'Why well, have Mr. Benjamin Button's age down at his eighteen? "'That's my age,' asserted Benjamin, flushing slightly. The registrar eyed him wearily. "'Now, surely, Mr. Button, you don't expect me to believe that.' Benjamin smiled wearily. "'I'm eighteen, he repeated. The register pointed sternly at the door. "'Get out,' he said. "'Get out of college and get out of town. You are a dangerous lunatic.' "'I'm eighteen. Mr. Hart opened the door. "'The idea!' he shouted. "'A man of your age trying to enter here as a freshman. Eighteen years old, are you? Well, I'll give you eighteen minutes to get out of town.' Benjamin Button walked with dignity from the room, and half a dozen undergraduates who were waiting in the hall followed him curiously with their eyes. When he had gone a little way, he turned around, faced the infuriated registrar, who was still standing in the door, and repeated in a firm voice, "'I am eighteen years old.' To a chorus of titters which went up from the group of undergraduates, Benjamin walked away. But he was not fated to escape so easily. On his melancholy walk to the railroad station he found that he was being followed by a group, then by a swarm, and finally by a dense mass of undergraduates. The word had gone around that a lunatic had passed the entrance examinations for Yale and attempted to palm himself off as a youth of eighteen. A fever of excitement permeated the college. Men ran hatless out of classes. The football team abandoned its practice and joined the mob, professors' wives with bonnets awry and bustles out of position ran shouting after the procession from which proceeded a continual succession of remarks aimed at the tender sensibilities of benjamin button he must be a wandering jew he ought to go to prep school at hit sage look at the infant prodigy he thought this was the old man's home go up to harvard Benjamin increased his gait, and soon he was running. He would show them. He would go to Harvard, and then they would regret these ill-considerate taunts. Safely on the train for Baltimore, he put his head from the window. "'You'll regret this,' he shouted. "'Ha, <laughs> ha!' the undergraduates laughed. "'Ha, ha, ha! It was the biggest mistake that Yale College had ever made.'" Chapter 5 in 1880, Benjamin Button was twenty years old, and he signaled his birthday by going to work for his father in Roger Button & Company Wholesale Hardware. It was in the same year that he began going out socially. That is, his father insisted on taking him to several fashionable dances. Roger Button was now fifty, and he and his son were more and more compatible. In fact, since Benjamin had ceased to dye his hair, which was still grayish, they appeared about the same age, and could have passed for brothers. One night in August they got into the phaeton, attired in their full-dress suits, and drove out to a dance at the Shelvin's Country Klaus, situated just outside of Baltimore. It was a gorgeous evening. A full moon drenched the road to the lusterless color of platinum and late-blooming harvest flowers breathed into the motionless air aromas that were like low half-heard laughter the open country carpeted for rods around with bright wheat was translucent as in the day it was almost impossible not to be affected by the sheer beauty of the sky almost there's a great future in the dry goods business roger button was saying he was not a spiritual man. His aesthetic sense was rudimentary. "'Old fellows like me can't learn new tricks,' he observed profoundly. "'It's you youngsters with energy and vitality that have the great future before you.' Far up the road the lights of the Shelvin's country house drifted into view, and presently there was a singing sound that crept persistently toward them. It might have been the fine plaint of violins or the rustle of the silver wheat under the moon. Pulled up behind a handsome brougham, whose passengers were disembarking at the door. A lady got out, then an elderly gentleman, then another young lady, beautiful as sin. Benjamin started. 
an almost chemical change seemed to dissolve and recompose the very elements of his body. A rigor passed over him, blood rose into his cheeks, his forehead, and there was a steady thumping in his ears. It was first love. The girl was slender and frail, with hair that was ashen under the moon and honey-colored under the sputtering gas-lamps of the porch. Over her shoulders was thrown a Spanish mantilla of softest yellow, butterflied in black. Her feet were glittering buttons at the hem of her bustled dress. Roger Button leaned over his son. That, he said, is young Hildegard Moncliffe, the daughter of General Moncliffe. Benjamin nodded coldly. Pretty little thing, he said indifferently. But when the boy had led the buggy away, Dad, you might introduce me to her. They approached the group of which Miss Moncrief was the center. Reared in the old tradition, she curtsied low before Benjamin. Yes, he might have a dance. He thanked her and walked away, staggered away. The interval until the time for his turn should arrive dragged itself out interminably. He stood close to the wall, silent, inscrutable, watching with murderous eyes the young bloods of as they eddied around Hildegard Moncliffe, passionate admiration in their faces. How obnoxious they seemed to Benjamin! How intolerably rosy! Their curling brown whiskers aroused in him a feeling equivalent to indigestion. But when his own time came, and he drifted with her out upon the changing floor, to the music of the latest waltz from Paris, his jealousies and anxieties melted from him like a mantle of snow. Blind with enchantment, he felt that life was just beginning. "'You and your brother got here just as we did, didn't you?' asked Hildegard, looking up at him with eyes that were like bright blue enamel. Benjamin hesitated. If she took him for his father's brother, would it be best to enlighten her? He remembered his experience at Yale, so he decided against it. It would be rude to contradict a lady. It would be criminal to mar this exquisite occasion with the grotesque story of his origin. It perhaps. So he nodded, smiled, listened, was happy. I like men of your age, Hildegard told him. Young boys are so idiotic. They tell me how much champagne they drink at college and how much money they lose playing cards. Men of your age know how to appreciate women. Benjamin felt himself on the verge of a proposal. With an effort, he choked back the impulse. You're just a romantic age, she continued. Fifty, twenty-five is too worldly. Wise, thirty is apt to be pale from overwork. Forty is the age of long stories that take a whole cigar to tell. Sixty is, uh, sixty is too near seventy. But fifty is the mellow age. I love fifty. Fifty seemed to Benjamin a glorious age. He longed passionately to be fifty. I've always said, went on Hildegard, that I'd rather marry a man of fifty and be taken care of than marry a man of thirty and take care of him. Benjamin, the rest of the evening, was bathed in honey-colored mist. Hildegard gave him two more dances, and they discovered that they were marvelously in accord on all the questions of the day. She was to go driving with him on the following Sunday, and then they would discuss all their questions further. Going home in the Phaeton just before the crack of dawn, when the first bees were humming and the fading moon glimmered in the cool dew, Benjamin knew vaguely that his father was discussing wholesale hardware. "'And what do you think should merit our biggest attention after hammers and nails?' the elder Button was saying. "'Love,' replied Benjamin, absent-mindedly. "'Lugs!' exclaimed Roger Button. "'Why, I've just covered the question of lugs.' Benjamin regarded him with dazed eyes just as the eastern sky was suddenly crackled with light, and an oriole yawned piercingly in the quickening trees. When six months later the engagement of Miss Hildegard Moncliffe to Mr. Benjamin Button was made known, I say made known, for General Moncliffe declared he would rather fall upon his sword than announce it. The excitement in Baltimore society reached a feverish pitch. 
The almost forgotten story of Benjamin's birth was remembered and sent out upon the winds of scandal in picturesque and incredible forms. It was said that Benjamin was really the father of Roger Button, that he was his brother, who had been in prison for forty years, that he was John Wilkes Booth in disguise, and finally that he had two small conical horns sprouting from his head. The Sunday supplements of the New York papers played up the case with fascinating sketches, which showed the head of Benjamin Button attached to a fish, to a snake, and finally to a body of solid brass. He became known journalistically as the Mystery Man of Maryland, but the true story, as is usually the case, had a very small circulation. However, everyone agreed with General Moncliffe that it was criminal for a lovely girl who could have married any beau in Baltimore to throw herself into the arms of a man who was assuredly fifty. In vain, Mr. Roger Button published his son's birth certificate. In large type in the Baltimore blaze, no one believed it. You had only to look at Benjamin and see. On the part of the two people most concerned, there was no wavering. So many of the stories about her fiancé were false that Hildegard refused stubbornly to believe even the true one. In vain, General Moncrief pointed out to her the high mortality among men of fifty, or at least among men who looked fifty. In vain he told her of the instability of the wholesale hardware business Hildegard had chosen to marry for mellowness, and marry she did. CHAPTER Seven. In one particular, at least, the friend of Hildegard Moncliffe were mistaken. The wholesale hardware business prospered amazingly. In the fifteen years between Benjamin Button's marriage in 1880 and his father's retirement in 1895, the family fortune was doubled, and this was due largely to the younger member of the firm. Needless to say, Baltimore eventually received the couple to its bosom. Even old General Moncrief became reconciled to his son-in-law when Benjamin gave him the money to bring out his history of the Civil War in twenty volumes, which had been refused by nine prominent publishers. In Benjamin himself, fifteen years had wrought many changes. It seemed to him that the blood flowed with new vigor through his veins. It began to be a pleasure to rise in the morning, to walk with an active step along the busy, sunny street to work untiringly with his shipments of hammers and his cargoes of nails. It was in 1890 that he executed his famous business coup. He brought up the suggestion that all nails used in nailing up the boxes in which nails were shipped are the property of the shippee. A proposal which became a statute was approved by Chief Justice Fossil and saved Roger Button and Company wholesale hardware more than six hundred nails every year. In addition, Benjamin discovered that he was becoming more and more attracted by the gay side of life. It was typical of his growing enthusiasm for pleasure that he was the first man of the city of Baltimore to own and run an automobile. Meeting him on the street, his contemporaries would stare enviously at the picture he made of health and vitality. He seems to grow younger every year, they would remark, and if old Roger Benjamin, now sixty-five years old, had failed at first to give a proper welcome to his son, atoned at last by bestowing on him what amounted to adulation. And here we come to an unpleasant subject, which it will be well to pass over as quickly as possible. There was only one thing that worried Benjamin Button his wife had ceased to attract him. At the time, Hildegard was a woman of thirty-five with a son, Roscoe, fourteen years old. In the early days of their marriage, Benjamin had worshipped her, but as the years passed, her honey-colored hair became an unexciting brown. The blue enamel of her eyes assumed the aspect of cheap crockery. Moreover, and most of all, she had become too settled in her ways, too placid, too content, too anemic, in her excitements, and too sober in her taste. As a bride, it had been she who had dragged Benjamin to dances and dinners. Now conditions were reversed. She went out socially with him, but without enthusiasm, devoured already by the eternal inertia 
which comes to live with each of us one day and stays with us to the end. Benjamin's discontent waxed stronger. At the outbreak of the Spanish-American War in 1898, his home had for him so little charm that he decided to join the army. With his business influence, he obtained a commission as captain and proved so adaptable to the work that he was made a major and finally a lieutenant colonel just in time to participate in the celebrated charge up San Juan Hill. He was slightly wounded and received a medal. Benjamin had become so attached to the activity and excitement of army life that he regretted to give it up. But his business required attention, so he resigned his commission, came home. He was met at the station by a brass band and escorted to his house. End of Part 1 This was the first experience with the charming old custom of having babies. Mr. Button was naturally nervous. He hoped it would be a boy so that he could be sent to Yale College in Connecticut, at which institution Mr. Button himself had been known for four years by the somewhat obvious nickname of Cuff. On the September morning consecrated to the enormous event, he arose nervously at six o'clock, dressed himself, adjusted an impeccable stock, and hurried forth through the streets of Baltimore to the hospital to determine whether the darkness of the night had borne in any new life upon its bosom. When he was approximately a hundred yards from the Maryland Private Hospital for Ladies and Gentlemen, he saw Dr. Keene, the family physician, descending the front steps, rubbing his hands together with a washing movement, as all doctors are required to do by the unwritten ethics of their profession. Mr. Roger Button, the president of Roger Button and Company Wholesale Hardware, began to run toward Dr. Keene with much less dignity than was expected from a southern gentleman of that picturesque period. Dr. Keene, he called. Dr. Keene. The doctor heard him, faced around, and stood waiting, a curious expression settling on his harsh, medicinal face as Mr. Button drew near. What happened? demanded Mr. Button, as he came up in a gasping rush. Section 1. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Section 1. Chapter 1. As long ago as 1860, it was the proper thing to be born at home. At present, so I am told, the high gods of medicine have decreed that the first cries of the young shall be uttered upon the anesthetic air of a hospital, preferably a fashionable one. So young Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were fifty years ahead of style when they decided one day in the summer of 1860 that their first baby should be born in a hospital. Whether this anarchism had any bearing upon the astonishing history I am about to set down will never be known. I shall tell you what occurred and let you judge for yourself. The Roger Buttons held an enviable position, both social and financial, in the antebellum Baltimore. They were related to the this family and that family, which, as every southerner knew, entitled them to membership in that enormous peerage which largely populated the confederate she agreed in a hushed voice very well but if you knew what a state it's put us all in this morning it's perfectly outrageous the hospital will never have a ghost of a reputation after hurry he cried hoarsely i can't stand this come this way then mr button he dragged himself after her at the end of a long hallway they reached a room from which proceeded a variety of howls. Indeed, a room which in later parlance would have been known as the crying room. They entered. Well, gasped Mr. Button, which is mine. There, said the nurse. Mr. Button's eyes followed her pointing finger, and this is what he saw. Wrapped in a voluminous white blanket and partially crammed into one of the cribs, there sat an old man, apparently about seventy years of age. His sparse hair, almost white, and from his chin, dripped a long, smoke-colored beard, which waved absurdly back and forth, fanned by the breeze, coming in at the window. He looked up at Mr. Button with dim, 
faded eyes, in which lurked a puzzled question. "'Am I mad?' thundered Mr. Button, his terror resolving into rage. "'Is this some ghastly hospital joke?' "'Doesn't seem like a joke to us,' replied the nurse severely. "'And I don't know whether you're mad or not.' Suddenly lost all desire to go into the Maryland private hospital for ladies and gentlemen. It was with the greatest difficulty that a moment later he forced himself to mount the steps and enter the front door. A nurse was sitting behind a desk in the opaque gloom of the hall. Swallowing his shame, Mr. Button approached her. "'Good morning,' she remarked, looking up at him pleasantly. "'Good morning. I, I'm Mr. Button.' At this, a look of utter terror spread itself over the girl's face. She rose to her feet and seemed about to fly from the hall, restraining herself only with the most apparent difficulty. "'I want to see my child,' said Mr. Button. The nurse gave a little scream. "'Oh, of course!' she cried, hysterically. "'Upstairs! Right upstairs! Go up!' She pointed the direction, and Mr. Button, bathed in cool perspiration, turned falteringly and began to mount to the second floor. In the upper hall he addressed another nurse, who approached him, basin in hand. "'I'm Mr. Button,' he managed to articulate. "'I want to see my—' Clank! The basin clattered to the floor and rolled in the direction of the stairs. Clank! Clank! It began a methodical descent, as if sharing in the general terror which this gentleman provoked. "'I want to see my child,' Mr. Button almost shrieked. He was on the verge of collapse. Clank! The basin reached the first floor. The nurse regained control of herself and threw Mr. Button a look of hearty contempt. "'All right, Mr. Button.' "'What was it? How is she? A boy? Who is what?' "'Talk sense,' said Dr. King sharply. He appeared somewhat irritated. "'Is the child born?' begged Mr. Button. Dr. King frowned. "'Why, yes, I suppose, after fashion.' Again he threw a curious glance at Mr. Button. Is my wife all right? Yes. Is it a boy or girl? Here now, cried Dr. Keene in a perfect passion of irritation. I'll ask you to go and see for yourself. Outrageous! He snapped the last word out in almost one syllable. Then he turned away, muttering, Do you imagine a case like this will help my professional reputation? One more would ruin me, ruin anybody. What's the matter? demanded Mr. Button, appalled. Triplets? No, not triplets, answered the doctor cuttingly. What's more, you can go and see for yourself, and get another doctor. I brought you into the world, young man, and I've been physician to your family for forty years, but I'm through with you. I don't want to see you or any of your relatives ever again. Goodbye. Then he turned sharply, and without another word climbed into his phaeton, which was waiting at the curbstone, and drove severely away. Mr. Button stood there upon the sidewalk, stupefied and trembling from head to foot. What horrible mishap had occurred? He had 